Hey guys, hey, um, I just wanted to do a quick walk through <clears throat> regarding the project for the Bendite Insight uh, flyer. And uh, we're all going to have different approaches about how we um, attack the information, but let me just bring that, um, that project PDF, PDF up for review real quick. So this is the PDF that I've put together and um, as far as the Ellen Lupton book, which she's talking about or emphasizing with some of these sections of the book are um, you know, marking paragraphs and indenting and uh, indicating with symbols, uh, captions. Um, but you know what, what really interested me was her, her discussion as far as hierarchy, which I think is extremely important um, when you're working on any kind of type-based document because you're trying to lead the viewer with indicators as far as what they should be looking at or reading first. And so essentially you can interpret that information as headers, like header one, header two, header three, header four. If you're going into header five, six, seven um, range, then that means you have a very complicated document. Typically, I really don't have headers or header, I guess, classifications beyond one, two, or three. One, of course, would be the most important, and three would be um, less important than one. So one, two, three in that order. Um, she's also talking about the grid. And I think generally, if you guys have had a class with me before, I talk about the grid quite a bit as a tool for organizing content. Um, and she talks about it, yeah, as, as a structural tool as well. So yeah. The grid and hierarchy are, are really what I'm kind of focusing on in this document. So let's um, let's dive in to the information that was given to me by uh, another professor. And he did actually ask me to do this project for him. So I thought, okay, I'll just make this into a student project. Um, if you come down here, you can actually see a copy of the email that he sent me. You know, and this is the kind, this is a typical, literally Orlando is the client here. And so this is the information that he gave me. And he even made a comment about this kind of strange photo that Robico had provided, but he said, that's what they wanted to do. So we got to do it and that's okay. That's what we do as designers. You know, we kind of follow suit sometimes. Um, there are some directions here. And I think what I really want to kind of emphasize with you guys at this point with using typography and creating documents is to break the rules sometimes a little bit and remember that graphic design is an expressive um, art. It's not just a functional art. So you can be experimental with the decisions that you make and how you're using words and letter forms. And so don't forget about that. Um, there was a section, where is that section with the actual content? So here we go, here's the quote unquote given, and this was given to us by Orlando White. Uh, and this was what, um, what he wants to emphasize. This is the information, this is the function, this is the reason that he wants the flyer created to advertise for this online virtual event. So obviously we need um, the title, uh, the, the description of the event, the two artists that are going to be in dialogue, the date, the time, including Mountain Standard Time. Uh, we want folks to know that it's online and Zoom. And then there's also uh, to our RSVP email Orlando Y. I actually did cut this down a little bit. And sometimes we do have that sort of license as designers. I, to me, I don't think we need to say to RSV or email. I mean, the email is right here, so that's pretty obvious. So I just said RSVP Orlando White. And also he did send me a follow-up email and he wanted it to be uh, his, uh, a different email. So, uh, but you can use this one, okay? For the version that you create. He wants a landscape format. And then I added this, the event is organized by two creative writing professors. So it's Orlando White and Jesse Maloney. Professor White and Professor Maloney asked me to do this for them. So, and I'm kind of honored, you know, they trust me to do a, a decent job. So it's kind of nice. And also I'm doing this pro bono because these are my buddies, but you know, obviously, you know, if you're running a business, uh, you never do anything for free. 
<clears throat> um, and also, you know, I'm going to be using this to teach you guys. So, uh, yeah, it's a double win for me. I get to do something nice for my friend and I also get to, you know, teach you guys. Um, I have been including this handy dandy diagram so that you guys can get a sense of um, how a typical semester with me progresses so that there aren't any surprises. And as you can see, things do stay busy. All right. So anyway, let's just back up. I've already completed the document. So this is more kind of a walkthrough and I will kind of try to detail things a little bit um, if I feel like they need to be unpacked further, um, but I can't guarantee it, but I just, you know, we're going to start with an eight and a half by 11 sheet, of course. And if I were doing that, I would hit command N and uh, I would find this uh, new document window and I would have to decide, well, do I want to work with picas or inches? Um, if I'm working with inches, obviously it changes here and the document is going to be 11 by eight and a half. We do not need facing pages, so I would definitely leave that off. In fact, I always leave this off anyway, unless I'm working on a book that literally reads that way. And it's handy for you to kind of see it on the screen that way. Otherwise, I'm not a big fan of facing pages, but um, but yeah, maybe that's just a weird thing with me. Uh, so yeah, 11 by eight and a half. Okay, everything looks good. We don't need margins. We get, we're gonna manage all this stuff ourselves, but you can adjust your margins and your slug and all that business down here if you choose to. So then you can hit create, but since I already have a document, I don't need to do that. So I'm just gonna hit command W and close that out and not even save it. So a good place to start usually when you're working on uh, any publication document, and this is a publication I know this is uh, for a typography course, but you know, obviously typography is publication because we're talking about print assets and making something, you know, with words and letter forms and expressing an event or who knows what. So um, first thing I want you to notice is, you know, the way that I've kind of organized all this information. Um, and the first place I would start is with the grid. And I suppose the reason I would do that is just because it's handy for organizing my content. I have to be real honest, though. Um, you know, when I started this project, I didn't want to be so analytical and structured with how I was laying things out. I just had a, an idea in mind because and the idea came from the fact that, you know, Orlando and Jesse have set up this event so that it's a dialogue or a conversation between two folks. So I was kind of thinking like, about Milton Glaser and, you know, like symbolism. And instead of saying, this is a dialogue, you know, with typeface words, I kind of wanted to show it in more of an illustrative way. And we'll get to that here in a second. So I, I really just kind of had this idea in my head for, for it being based on these bubbles because bubbles indicate conversational exchange. And that was the idea that kept coming back to me. That's the big idea for this project. You always need some kind of big idea. Secondly, um, I, I was looking at the title, Midnight Insight, and I was looking at the words, and I realized that there was a relationship between night and sight. You know, they were spelled very similarly, and I, I was kind of fixated on, on doing something interesting with the typography in that realm. I also had another idea um, originally, but it became more simplified. But I also wanted to sort of slice and cut through these typographic um, word elements for the title Midnight and Insight, and then sort of smash them together or collage them together. Um, but the, the idea did end up evolving and simplifying. So things can simplify and evolve at the same time. You know, complexity isn't always the best route. Uh, and I was also under a kind of a time crunch because I have just been sort of busy lately. And, and I did kind of procrastinate this project for honestly for you guys and for Orlando and Jesse. So I literally ended up doing this project yesterday in one afternoon. Um, but if you have an idea in your head, that's okay. You know, um, you know that, that's truth be told. I mean, I've been running on empty in that manner for many years where I have all these projects lined up and I do kind of end up stressing myself unnecessarily and doing them at the last minute. I just happen to kind of work that way and thrive that way sometimes.
but I don't suggest that you guys do it that way. <laughs> so anyway, here's the grid. And um, you can kind of see the way that I have this document laid out too. I always do this. Um, I have a type of typography or typographic layer at the very top because we want that information to be at the top. Um, and by the way, uh, you'll also notice that I'm using cyan and magenta. That's just a thing with me too, because I love CMYK. So cyan, magenta, yellow, and K for key or black. So I'm actually using CM, not Y, but and K. So I'm using the three of those as my primary colors for this project. So here's the typography, and that's why it's looking a little bit funny because um, the insight, uh, midnight insight is also using cyan and magenta. And um, I created this sort of illustrated bubble to go inside of another bubble because I wanted some texture and I ended up grabbing an image. I loved this vertical kind of repeating uh, pattern here and I thought it would be nice. And also uh, it's just sort of like a, a very kind of subtle insertion of my, my perspective on design and things that I value, but this happens to be an image from um, the situation is international and uh, this reads as French, but it means under the cobblestones. And I almost feel, I almost felt like, you know, that indicated that the idea behind this dialogue between these two artists, because they're sort of unearthing and looking below the surface to, to have, um, to, to unpack how their creativity operates, which is really unique for each artist. But in, but in order to do that, you kind of have to excavate a little bit. You have to look beneath. And that's why I thought this image uh, would work well. So again, you know what I mean? If, if someone did have a question, you know, for me, like, why did you use that image? Uh, I, would, I would have an answer. Uh, and that's kind of what I expect during critique as well from you guys. So we have the, the Midnight Insight typography. Then we have the Under the cob Cobblestone. We're kind of working backwards here, by the way, guys. And then we have a big bubble, which again is like this very kind of like sweeping, bold move. But if you look at this bubble, I I used it purposefully because it has this beautiful kind of diagonal gesture. And remember, you know, when folks are looking at a document, they're reading from left to right, and then they're going to go down in the into the bottom left hand corner again diagonally and then their eye is going to move right and it's probably going to end in that lower right hand corner so you're going to start up here in the top left hand corner and the human eye is going to uh, move through a document in a z pattern right and it's going to end in that lower right hand corner and so you should consider that eye movement when you're thinking about hierarchy and placing um, the given text from the client so there's my big bubble. And then um, I, I did the same move with this under the cobblestone image as I did with the actual profile images of Robico and Sherwin. And so there are the actual images and see, and here are the medium bubbles that I'm using. Okay. And you can kind of see like these aren't falling directly on the grid in the background. I, I think I told you guys that when I started that um, this tutorial that I actually purposefully did not follow the the rules of this structural grid in the background as closely. Although um, you could argue that by saying instead of if you broke this grid down, instead of it being uh, what is that two by two inch squares, if you broke it down into one by one inch squares, you would still see some sort of intuitive structure that I follow just because after you do this for X or Y amount of years, you end up having some ingrained moves uh, embedded within you. And so you guys, that's what you're working on right now as emerging designers. You're working on those that, that embedded designer DNA that you, you essentially would apply to any project um, that you work on. I mean, another word to describe that, I guess, would be your voice, your design voice. Um, so yeah, we all, we all have a certain way of approaching visual problems. OK, so. Um, so that's everything. That's the document, except um, obviously without the grid. So I'm going to remove that. And that's what this document ended up looking like. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is 
uh, let's see, let's talk about hierarchy for a second. So obviously Midnight Insight is the title and I wanted that up here at the top. And I actually did not do this sort of inversion, like this reflected inversion of the text in InDesign. I did it in Illustrator. Um, and so I just created a small document. And if I'm not mistaken, that artboard is 11 inches wide by four inches. And so I figured that's the amount of space that I need to place this document into the InDesign document. So I, I started by, of course, just using my text tool and for example, writing uh, midnight. And for some reason I wanted the, again, these are intuitive rules or, or decisions sometimes. I wanted the midnight to be, uh, first of all, Helvetica. So I can come up here and I can choose Helvetica and then I can blow up the size. And I think I blew it up even beyond that. To like, uh, if I remember correctly, it was like 90, something like that. And right now it's bold and uh, it looks to me like I just used regular, correct? So you can kind of see that's not matching up though exactly though, is it? And the reason being is because I went into the character settings and I added some kerning or, or spacing between those letters. And so um, there we go, because I wanted those letter forms to breathe a little bit. And so this was what I ended up with, but you'll notice, look, this is still a text object. And, and what I did so that I could approach each of these letter forms as individuals is I expanded and ungrouped this text box. So the first thing I did was of course center it because I wanted it centered uh, within this artboard. Okay, you can see, look at that. It's looks like I did use a slightly larger um, typeface for this version, but that's okay for the for this tutorial, it's fine. But select your text object, then come up here to object, expand, okay, expand everything, the object and the fill, okay, and then ungroup, okay, and so now look at this, all of these guys are individuals, um, and so I can select all of these guys, and of course I had sign and magenta on my brain so, but it could be anything. We'll do this one yellow, okay? Um, and kind of love like, you know, CMYK, just these three colors next to each other drives me wild, it's crazy. Um, okay, so now all I did was make a copy of this and I come up here to object, transform, and then reflect, okay? And I'm reflecting vertically all right so now and then i can change this color to like oh let's say green just for the heck of it and then i just zoomed in and with if you look at these objects now they have if you use the black arrow tool you can select them individually but if you use the white arrow tool look at you can even see the anchor points of these letter forms and so if you select everything together, you can kind of move. And look at that. You can literally just kind of grab these guys and nestle them against the top letter forms. And that's how like I did that. Of course, this is interesting because there's an intersection. So you might have to decide, well, which, which G is more dominant, the yellow or the green. So I'll leave that up to you all for those, that decision. Uh, but yeah, you can kind of see that I'm just kind of moving these guys around. And th this is a process that I'm a more comfortable doing in Illustrator. But I think the Illustrator is just more articulate and detailed with this kind of thing. And that's what if you're wondering why I'm not doing this in, in InDesign, that's pretty much why Illustrator is just a much more surgical tool, in my opinion. So let's, you know, if I'm a doctor, and I'm operating on a letter form, I'm just choosing the right tool to get the job done. So uh, I think you guys can kind of see where this is going and then everything is centered, right? Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I don't need any of this because you guys got the gist of what's going on. So I'm gonna delete it. Oop, and look at that. I didn't get all the, okay. Should have cleaned that up, hit save again. 
And now I'm going to go back to InDesign. And then you can kind of see, look, now I'm getting an error. It's saying, uh oh, you made a change to that document. You need to go to your links panel. Okay. And let's see if we can, there it is right there. And all I have to do is click refresh this little relink icon, update link. And now they're talking again because we're seeing the positive happy icon there. All right. Um, so that's how that was placed in there. Okay. And the other thing is I'm using Baskerville. And I, of course, I didn't need to use Illustrator for any of this other comp, any of this other simplified uh, typography. So, but yeah, this is Baskerville and then back to Helvetica, Helvetica again down here. Although I am using bold, regular, and Helvetica light, and I'm also playing with the kerning. So if I come over here to my layers and I unlock uh, typography, I can double click in and you can kind of see, look at, so I'm gonna select just that text right there. That's 18 Helvetica light with 25 kerning. This is 24 bold with 25 kerning. So yeah, you can kind of see I'm applying. Um, and, and why am I doing that? Well, it goes back to Ellen Lupton talking about hierarchy. Um, so this is my H1, this is my H2. This is generally all my H3 information down here. Uh, although I am still playing with, with typeface design. And I also pushed this online zoom the client wanted that in a way I kind of felt like it was a little bit redundant, but you know, he's the client and he, he's also made, I think some of these flyers um, previously. So he knows what works. He knows what he needs. Sometimes you, you can push back on the client a little bit, but more often than not, they know what's going on. They know what they need. And, and if you have a better idea, don't be afraid to voice it. So anyway, I, I definitely wanted the date to be uh, to pop forward. And then I thought the time was second as far as importance. I'll tell you what, the reason why I left RSVP a white at the top was because um, I had more room up here. Uh, you know, I was running out of space down here. So um, I had to make some sacrifices in that respect. I also wanted the top of these letter forms. You can see I added this guide. <laughs> I, I dragged this guide from the ruler. You can drag these out like so. But I dragged it down so uh, that guide would talk to the top of that bubble. So I would kind of have a sense of lining those guys up visually. But again, you know, when I was working on this document, I was also working uh, sort of more organically. Uh, and, I, and I did that purposefully, although I did still have some, some rules or embedded um, ideas about design kind of come through with this process. Um, I chose Helvetica because it works and it solves problems and it's a modern contemporary sans serif typeface that I just really, I love using. Uh, it's kind of like one of my go-tos and a lot of folks think that Helvetica is overused, but I am not one of them. I've, I've also been sort of juxtaposing modern contemporary typefaces with classic typefaces. So this is Baskerville down here. And you can even see that I'm using, um, a, like I'm trying to emphasize hierarchy here. Uh, so a late night conversation, I wanted that information there, of course, but somehow I wanted Sherwin, Bitsui and Robico to, to pop. And so you can kind of see if we highlight that typeface that's regular Baskerville and this is bold Baskerville. So again, you know, like pushing and pulling the typefaces to decide what's important. Um, uh, one of the reasons why I did end up adding this bubble within, or I guess this photo montage within the larger block bubble was because I was concerned that some of this, these little itty bitty bits of information were kind of distracting. I don't know why I thought it was interfering with the functionality or the legibility of the typeface somehow. So I thought I would kind of like cool it down a little bit by adding some uh, some mild grayscale in here. I don't know, even know if it really helped because I ended up actually, if we look at this, if I unlock it and select it, you can see this opacity is at 20% right now. So if I pump, 
If I bump that up to 100, that's the actual image right there. But that's completely just distracting. You know, it's just not really helping. Uh, I just wanted a little bit of that information there, so I brought it down to 20% with opacity. Um, and by the way, the way that I created these little bubbles is with the pencil tool. So I'm actually going to do that on this live layer just on the side. You can just kind of create a little, see that? And then you immediately just hit Command D. And then you can go in and grab, let's see, Typography 1, Insight, Assets. See how I have all this organized? This is how your folder should look for a project. You know, I have my primary files up here at the top, and then I have my assets within this folder. I didn't even use all this stuff. I just kind of threw it in my grocery store bag just in case, you know, I wanted to put it into my stew. But here are the photos of Sherwin. And by the way, they came as um, the, the Sherwin Bitsui photo was had color information. And I, I removed that and made it black and white. So select that image and boom. And then you can come up here to object, uh, fill frame proportionally. <laughs> so that's how I made these little bubbles within the bubble. Obviously, we don't need that. So yeah, that pretty much sums up this document. And it did take me a little while, you know, it took me longer than I expected, you know, because you end up just kind of staring at your screen, wondering what's right. And I did actually get some outside advice. And I always assume that you're doing that. You cannot just sit there and stare at a document for three or four hours and think that, um, think that you know best. You really should just ask anyone, just anyone who doesn't even know you, you think they're not design experts, you know, just like your mom or your dad or your cousin, whoever, and ask them, just say, what do you think? And they'll give you some good, pretty good, honest feedback because, you know, they're, they're just folks out there in the real world experiencing design at the same level we are, all are. And they, they're actual experts at design, but they don't know it, which is really interesting. But they'll, they'll be able to look at something and they'll be able to say, I think it works. Or they'll be able to say, I don't, I don't understand this document. It's not working. Um, uh, last thing I, I wanted to mention was I do like to coordinate color within documents. And I wanted this sort of diagram diagrammatic coordination between these two, two bubbles. And this was definitely sort of an intuitive mo move that I made, adding the cyan and the magenta right there. Um, but I decided I was happy with it. So that's that. Of course, when you're ready to export, you just come up here to file export. And I did send the client a PDF. Uh, and I also sent them a high quality JPEG. And I also sent them a web JPEG, which would be 72 DPI. So I sent, I did send the client multiple. Uh, first, I sent him a draft and then I sent him multiple final versions uh, so that he has plenty to work with when he's putting it on Facebook or sending it to friends via email. I don't know what he's going to do after that. That's his business. So, but my business is making sure that he has two or three possible different file types like PDF, PNG, or JPEG at some different qualities so that he can um, make those decisions. And you might even like describe that in the email, say, Hey, I uploaded a web version. And of course you can describe your web uh, files right here. In fact, this one says midnight insight web. Dot JPEG so that Orlando knows you gotta you gotta remember you're working with folks who aren't designers you know they're they don't always know which document to choose or which one to use um, so yeah in a way like you know as a designer you're constantly educating the public about your process and 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 facilitating I think facilitating is the word that I use a lot so yeah uh, thanks for viewing and I hope this was helpful.